Hi folks, welcome to A Victory Garden for Maine, brought to you by the University of Maine Cooperative Extension. My name is Lori. With me today are Becca, Cara, and Marjorie. Today's topic is vegetable gardening, where to begin. I know this topic is going to be extremely helpful to first-time gardeners, so let's go ahead and get started. Becca, you have our first question. Thanks, Lori. I'm excited to grow a vegetable garden this year. How do I get started? I always suggest that people think first about where on their property they can put their garden. Of all the aspects to consider, the amount of sunlight an area gets is what's most important. That will dictate what and how much you can grow. Warm season crops need at least six hours of full sun, with more being better. And what are the warm season crops? Those are things like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers, melons, and eggplants. But if I don't get that much sunlight in my yard, is there anything I can grow? If you don't have that much sunlight anywhere in your yard, you can still grow vegetables, but you need to focus on the ones that are cool season vegetables, ones where you eat the leaves. With those, you can get by with four to six hours of full sun or a longer stretch of partial shade. Remember that this position of the sun will change throughout the year, and so you may get more sun exposure in midsummer when the sun is not being blocked by buildings or trees. Marjorie, what are your thoughts? There are some other aspects of location to think about as well. If your garden is close to the house, you'll be more likely to check it daily and you'll catch problems sooner. You'll also want to be close to a source of water and have easy access to tools. And are there trees near the garden site? They not only cast shade, but they can compete with your garden plants for water. I know that soil is really important. So what should I be looking for? The soil is an extremely important part of gardening. And you want a soil that drains well, but not too much. This is determined in part by soil texture or the proportion of sand, silt, and clay in the soil. Think about what you know about the soil. Does it tend to drain very quickly? Do you have trouble keeping plants growing there well watered? If so, it may have a lot of sand, and it may be difficult to keep your garden watered too. On the other hand, does the soil in that location drain very slowly, and it's hard to get it to dry out? In that case, the soil may have a lot of clay. Do you know that the soil tends to puddle or crust? These can be indications of a poorly drained soil. On the other hand, a well-drained soil does not tend to form puddles or crusts. Are there things that I can do to check the soil drainage myself? Yes, there are some things you can do to check the soil drainage yourself. One thing you can do is to get an idea of what the soil texture is like. You can tell a lot by seeing how well the soil sticks to itself when you try to form a ribbon with it. To do this test, get a handful of soil, get it moist but not dripping wet. Mix it really well. Then try to push a ribbon of soil between your thumb and forefinger and see how long a ribbon you can create. The longer the ribbon, the more clay a soil has. If there's a lot of clay in the soil, then you may have some trouble with soil drainage. You can check soil drainage with a percolation test. To do this, dig a hole 12 inches deep and 12 inches across. Fill it with water and let it drain. Then refill it with water and see how long it takes for it to drain. Measure the change in the water level every hour. Ideally, you'd be looking for a soil that drains two inches every hour. This is a soil that will have drainage that's adequate for most vegetable garden plants. What else do I need to know about soil before I can move forward? It's always a good idea to get your soil tested. This will give you an idea of what plant nutrients you need to add for your garden. It can also tell you whether or not you need to adjust pH. If you run your soil test through the University of Maine Soil Testing Laboratory, they will also run a lead scan. If your soil has high lead levels, then you may need to adjust your gardening plans to minimize soil disturbance. Also consider the history of the site. Maybe you know that it was used in the past for machinery repair, and you might be concerned about contamination of the soil. In that case, you could choose to garden in tall raised beds, filling those beds with new soil. This would keep the plants from rooting into the potentially contaminated soil beneath. If you use a barrier at the bottom, something like landscape fabric, then that can further impede rooting in, into the soil below. The sunniest, most level spot on my property is the septic system leach field. Can I grow vegetables there? Even though it's sunny, it's not a good idea to put a vegetable garden on a leach field. Your leach field is designed to treat your home's wastewater or sewage through filtration and the action of microorganisms in the soil. 
Leach fields are designed to have grass growing on them, and using them for other things can impede their function. Vegetables growing on top of or right next to a leach field can become contaminated by wastewater that has not yet been treated by the field. Plants on disposal fields can absorb wastewater pathogens, and eating vegetables that have absorbed these pathogens can make you very sick. The spot where I want to put my garden is currently all grass. What do I need to do to get started? For an in-ground garden, we suggest that you start at least a year before your first garden. This will allow you to use a number of different techniques to prepare the soil and to suppress weeds, things like using cover crops. If you just rototill the area and put in your garden, the lawn grasses will regrow and annual weed seeds will germinate and it will be a big mess. That's no fun for gardening. To start a garden where there is a lawn, you need to first eliminate the grass. If you don't remove or kill or somehow set back the existing sod, it will continue to grow and it will outcompete your garden plants. There's a few ways to do this. You can rototill or turn the soil over by hand with a spade and then pull out the chunks of sod and shake the soil off of the roots. Or you could kill the sod by mowing it really, really close to the ground and then covering it with layers of cardboard or an old rug or a heavyweight dark plastic tarp for three to four weeks. After that, it will be easier to turn the soil over by hand or with a rototiller. You could also use a sod cutter to remove the sod. Set it at a depth where it removes the crowns of the grass plants but leaves as much topsoil as possible behind. You can pile the sod upside down and let it decompose off to the side. I think my soil is too shallow for a garden. Uh, there is a big rock close to the surface in the sunniest area, so what do I do? If your soil is too shallow or of poor quality, you might want to purchase some good quality screened loam and create raised beds. One cubic yard of loam will more than fill two beds that each measure three feet by five feet. Can you tell me how to make a raised bed? Usually raised beds are no more than four feet across because you need to be able to reach into the center from either side of the bed without stepping in it. A raised bed can be any length. You can build it right on top of your lawn. Just place some newspaper or cardboard over the grass before filling it with loam. Your beds can be framed or unframed. The beds should be at least six inches deep and up to 12 inches deep to accommodate the root systems of your vegetables. You can use wood, stone, or other materials to form the sides. Here's what a portion of my garden looks like. The property is on a ledge, so the soil is very shallow, and it's also on a slope. So I built permanent raised beds by shoveling the topsoil from the pathway areas onto the growing beds. And following the contour of the land, I framed each bed with rocks that I pulled from the garden. Other than a lot of hard labor, the inputs were minimal. If you can start at least six months before your first garden, you can use a technique called layer gardening. This uses many layers of organic material, at least 18 inches, that then compost in place to form a growing medium for your plants. Typically, the layers will alternate between materials that are high in nutrients, things like compost, manure, or grass clippings, and materials that are low in nutrients, things like straw, newspaper, or shredded leaves. These will compost in place and shrink, but this does take time, so be sure to plan ahead if you want to use this technique. My neighbor grows vegetables in containers. Should I try that? Growing in containers is a great option, especially if you have limited space. You'll still need plenty of sun and a water source very close by. Since container-grown plants don't have access to earth where they can mine deeply for water, during the hot, dry days of summer, you may have to water multiple times a day. You'll need a good potting soil for your containers. Never use garden soil itself. When put into a container, it compacts and it impedes drainage and aeration and plants grow poorly, if at all. Container soils are referred to as soilless media because they actually contain no soil at all. They're composed of various things such as peat, vermiculite, perlite, bark, coir fiber, which is ground coconut hulls, and they come in a variety of recipes depending on the manufacturer. Because they're low in nutrients, you can add compost, 
up to 25% by volume. And you will still need to fertilize your containerized plants regularly throughout the growing season with a water-soluble fertilizer. A few tips can help you with your container gardening. First, make sure that your containers have good drainage. For example, these tomatoes are growing in old washing machine drums and they have ready-made drainage. You'll need to check your chosen containers to make sure that they have adequate drainage holes as well. Also, be sure to grow varieties that are compact. They are better suited to the limited rooting volume in a container. So read the plant descriptions carefully and look for things like great for containers or compact in the variety description. Be sure to choose a container that's the correct size and depth for the types of vegetables you want to grow. For example, one cherry tomato should grow in a container that contains at least four to five gallons of potting material, and it should be at least eight to 12 inches deep. Salad greens, on the other hand, can get by with a much smaller container and only four to six inches of medium. For small plants like greens, be sure to follow the spacing recommendations on the seed packet. That's good to know. Will I save money growing my own vegetables? Growing your own vegetable garden can help you save money on your grocery bill, for sure. But there will be an initial investment. And if you're starting for the first time, there are some upfront costs you need to be prepared for. You will need a soil test and tools, and fertilizers, compost, a hose, watering can, seeds, seedlings, and labels. If you can get some of your supplies secondhand, that will help you save money. Also, think about whether you need fencing to keep deer, rabbits, or other wildlife out of the garden. And if you're going with raised beds, is your soil adequate or do you need to purchase loam? And will you need framing materials for your raised beds? To get the best value from your space, grow plants that produce a large volume of food, like tomatoes, summer squash, leaf lettuce, and green beans. Oh, and make sure your family will eat what you choose to grow. I'm nervous about getting started. Do you have any tips for making my first vegetable garden more manageable? My first recommendation is to start small. A couple of three by five beds can produce quite a bit of food and they are manageable to maintain. Also, make sure you prepare your soil properly according to a soil test. This initial investment of time and labor will pay off in the long run. And educate yourself about the vegetables you want to grow and what their needs are. Visit your garden every day. Don't let weeds overwhelm your vegetable plantings. And lastly, ask for help from experienced gardeners, neighbors, nursery workers, and certainly Humane Cooperative Extension. Thank you to Cara, Marjorie, and Lori. So to recap, Pick a site that gets enough sun, at least six hours for vegetables, and four to six hours for leafy greens. When selecting a potential site for your garden, check your soil texture and drainage, submit a soil test, and start killing grass and prepping your site as early as possible. And if you don't have an ideal garden site, you can still build raised beds or grow in containers. Be prepared for an initial investment in materials, and lastly, have fun. More information is available on our website and in the video description. Please be sure and check out our next video in the series, Planning Your Garden.